Maybe you want to add farming to your game and have plants grow after a certain amount of time has passed. Or maybe you want some of your game's enemies to come out from hiding at specific times during the day or night. Or well, maybe you want something completely different that still needs some sort of in-game time. Either way, let's start working on our time system. In this episode, we will create the foundations for the system. We will create a time system class and make the time move at another speed than the real time. In later episodes, we will then look into creating a GUI for the time, how to alter the speed of the time, and finally, how to use it all to create a day and night cycle. If you haven't already seen the introduction to this series, then I suggest you go ahead and do that first. There's a link to the video in the description. And now let's get started. Okay, so let's start by going to the script editor and create a new script that inherits from Node. This will be the base for our time system. So let's also give it the class name, time system. We also need a new script for storing a date and time. I will make this a resource. Again, I'm making sure to give the new resource an appropriate class name. In this new date time resource, we need at least four exported variables to keep track of the time. One for seconds, one for minutes, one for hours, and one for days. We could create these using the simple export annotation. However, since we know that each of these variables should be limited within a certain range, we will instead use the export underscore range annotation. This enables us to create a range that the values will climb to when we change them from the inspector menu. Okay, I'm just gonna stop the video here for a short moment. It wasn't until I'd finished editing this whole video and had moved on to creating the solutions for the exercises that I realized I had added an export range for the days here as well. And this is a mistake. The days should not be limited to a certain range at this point. So please ignore this and use the simple export annotation instead. And now, let's get back to the video. Each of these will be an integer and set to zero by default. Let's also create a method that will increase the time by a certain number of seconds. This should take a float as input. For now though, let's leave this method with a pass. Now, back in our time system class, we need two exported variables. First, we add one with an instance of the date time resource we just created. We can use this later to start from a specific time in the inspector menu. We also need a variable that specifies how many in-game seconds a real-time second will be. I'm calling this ticks per second, where ticks will be the in-game seconds and seconds will be the real-time seconds. Finally, let's add an instance of this time system to our game. In the world scene, click the plus here to add a new node and search for our new custom time system class. Now, when we select the time system node, we will be able to set the ticks per second and create a new date time. Okay, so now our world has an instance of the time system and the time system has a date time. Now it's time to get these to work together so the time will increase. In our time system class, let's implement the Godot process method. This will be called every frame, 
so it will be a good place to update our time. Let's call the increase by sec method on our date time object here. The delta in this function is the elapsed time in seconds since the previous frame. So the number of seconds we want to update our date time object with will be delta times ticks per sec. Now let's go back to the date time script and insert a breakpoint in the increase by sec method and then test the game to check that the method is being called. Try to on pause a few times to make sure that the method is being called again and again. Down in the debugger we can also take a look at what the delta seconds is in each call. You can also try to change the value of ticks per second in the time system class to check that this changes delta seconds as expected here. Finally, we need to update the time in our date time resource. If you looked in the debugger before, you might have noticed that delta seconds rarely was a whole number. This is why we specified it should be a float earlier and not an integer. We don't want to lose any time information here. But this also means that we can just increase the date times seconds with delta seconds and ignore the rest of the value. So we first create a new float variable called delta time. In the increase by sec method, we then first increase this delta time with delta seconds. And if delta time is less than one, then we just return, because we need at least one whole second to increase any of the time variables in our date time resource. If delta time is one or more, we cast it into a new integer variable. and decrease the delta time with the value of this variable. Now the delta time variable will be less than one again. We can then use our new delta int seconds to increase the seconds. The minutes should only be updated if seconds are 60 or more. But depending on how fast our time system is moving, we could just have increased seconds by more than 60. So the actual amount of minutes to increase with is going to be the seconds divided by 60. Remember that since both of these are integers, so will the result be. We increase both the hours and days in the same manner. But wait a minute, now we might have increased all the variables with the new time. This, of course, isn't going to work as it is now. To see why, let's set a breakpoint at the top of the increase method and watch how the values increase in each step. You can increase the ticks per second to make everything speed up a bit, which will make the problem easier to test. What we are missing is to wrap the values. We can do this using the modulo operator, which returns the remainder of an integer division. So seconds will be set to seconds modulo 60, the same for minutes, and hours will be hours modulo 24. Now, all we need to do is test again. Instead of using a breakpoint, we will be using print debug to see what happens. So let's add a print debug that prints the days, hours, minutes, and seconds. And then run the game and look in the output window to see how the time changes now. Again, remember you can use ticks per sec to change the speed of the time. And you can also edit 
the start date and time to start testing from a specific time. Use these to test all the different cases you can think of. Like here, when I start at 23 hours and 55 minutes, and want to test that the change in days work as expected. Wow! Now we actually created the foundation for our time system. Remember that there are a few exercises available for all paying members on YouTube and Patreon. These will make you dig even deeper into what we've been looking on in this video. Solutions will be available for the Patreon tiers that usually gets the project files for my tutorials. Some of you might be wondering why I didn't choose a timer to keep track of when we increase the in-game seconds. We could do this in theory, but there is a limit to how often a timer can update since it can emit once per frame at most. So for very low wait times, it's recommended to use the process function instead. Just like we do in this video, because we want our in-game time to move faster than the real time. And that was it for this episode. Next time, we will look into how we can create a GUI to show our new time. I hope you liked this video. Bye!